So we have three speakers tonight. We have Lisa Feiner and Jackie Bishop of Sharp Again Naturally, and Patricia Tomowski of Health Advocates Worldwide, who are presenting on preventing and reversing Alzheimer's and dementia. How about a warm Hollywood welcome to folks who came from across the country to present to you tonight our team. So, show of hands, how many of you know someone who is suffering from Alzheimer's disease or dementia? And that how many of you have wondered about your own cognition? Pretty good. So, here. is there anyone here who already believes that there's something that you can do to reverse Alzheimer's and dementia? Great. Well, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, we hope to change your mind. I'm Lisa Feiner, this is Jackie Bishop, and we are founding members of Sharp Again Naturally. Um, we'd like to each tell you a little bit about how we got involved. Um, I have been working with elders at a nursing and rehabilitation facility for over 20 years. First as a volunteer, then as a board member, I recently stepped down as board chair. And in addition, I. 12 years as a holistic health coach, working with clients to help them make better choices around nutrition and lifestyle. And I'm Jackie Bishop, and I'm here uh, largely because I lost my mother about four years ago after 17 years of decline. And um, that that's a hard way to go, and I was scared to death. And when I began having symptoms of my own three years ago, um, the I was lucky enough to have begun learning from Tish Tomowski and uh, and Scott Douglas filming back there about these strategies that we're going to tell you about tonight. And I actually have turned my situation around. Uh, I'm not all the way back because there's some heavy metal detoxing that, uh, that I need to do. And I'm researching that now. I'm not, just, not sure exactly what I'm going to do. But uh, the strategy that I did use is, has worked amazingly. Uh, I am back. So um, anyway, so we're here to tell you some good news about Alzheimer's. And uh, for the most part, people don't hear a lot of good news about Alzheimer's. So this is really kind of cool for us to be able to do. Um, the first thing I have to tell you is that cases of dementia have been reversed. They are documented. They, are, they were permanent. And um, there's no questioning about whether or not the, they're real. Uh, the second thing about that I want to tell you is that the remedies, the approaches used to reverse these cases were not exotic. Some of them are in uh, your own kitchen, uh, and they're not that expensive either, especially when you compare it to the cost of having dementia, which is uh, stunning. And the third thing I want to tell you is that there is a wonderful film being made about this. And part of the reason that Sharp began formed in the first place was to help the fi filmmakers uh, raise funds to finish this film. Um, that's the good news. There is some uh, challenging news, and that's the fact that when you go to your doctor after tonight, uh, your doctor may think this is nonsense, and uh, because uh, there's very little going on in the medical world, in the larger medical world, that supports the idea that Alzheimer's is reversible. And part of the reason that they don't support it is that they don't get educated about the possibilities of a functional medicine, holistic medicine. And they weren't educated some years ago when they were first, uh, first got their medical degree, and they don't hear much about it uh, now when, and they don't have time to keep up with it. So, uh, the, and the other thing is that the research 
the, because the protocols that uh, we suggest are not that expensive, it means that nobody's going to make a fortune off them. And so they don't attract a lot of research money. Um, the, uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to tell, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are and why we're here. And then you're going to see clips from this wonderful video. And then um, Lisa and Tish will tell you more about, uh, about the details of the people that you saw who turned it around. And then we'll have a Q&A. Sharp Again Naturally uh, has a mission to educate the public in, uh, about reversible forms of dementia and Alzheimer's. And also to advocate for a protocol that addresses all these reversible causes. Um, a comprehensive protocol that every single dementia patient would have. They would get that kind of attention. And we also uh, collaborate with other organizations who are basically up to the same uh, aims. So it's uh, educate, advocate, and collaborate. That's what we do. Um, Health Advocates Worldwide um, is a filmmaking organization, basically research and filmmaking, and they then they uh, express what they find through film, through documentaries, through websites, and through books. And uh, you'll, you're seeing the early stages of both these organizations, so you can say you knew us when. So I'm going to turn this over to Lisa now. Okay, so I think a first uh, step here is to define some of our terms. And we'd like you to know that dementia is the broad category that talks about cognitive decline. And you'll see up here this list of uh, you know, issues that people might have. I mean, they're, they surround memory, they're, they're around things like uh, you know, word recall and uh, really executive functioning skills as well, which would be problem solving, your judgment. Um, Alzheimer's disease is said to be the largest subset of dementia and distinguished by plaques and tangles in the brain. And the traditional medical community would tell you today that it is incurable. So what if Alzheimer's disease symptoms could be reversed? We know, having uh, seen Tish and Scott's work and also the research that we've done, that many different factors can lead to the same conclusion. So people can be manifesting lots of symptoms and we know that they are treatable. Until all of the relevant factors are tested for and treated, you never know that a case is hopeless. And we'll share with you tonight some people who had tried many different things until they actually had arrived at either a, a group of treatments that worked or something in particular that was really their magic bullet. So at the outset, we want you to know, I and mean, you probably can tell, we are not medical professionals and would encourage you to see your doctors for any treatment that you'd like to follow with the caveat that you might have to see a functional medicine specialist, a naturopath, somebody who um, has knowledge about holistic treatments. Because most traditional doctors, as Jackie explained, are not trained in the kinds of things that we're going to talk to you about tonight. So now without further ado, I would like to show you some of the film clips uh, that show, that demonstrate really what we're talking about. I think I just quit thinking. My vision, my thinking, my memory become crystal clear. 
you must have been misdiagnosed. You didn't have Alzheimer's because you got well. I can think, I can function, and I feel at peace. Experts declare that Alzheimer's has no cure. The truth is, in many cases, there is a cure, but most people don't know about it. Hard to believe? We have proof. I'm Alan Scott Douglas. And I'm Patricia Tanowski. We found dozens of people across the country with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia who got their minds back. So we decided to make a documentary film. We need your help to finish the film and tell the world. Here is some of our footage. I had no mind. I couldn't process anything and my retention was a second and a half. Disability was given to me within two hours. The assessment was made. I failed every test and my IQ was 57. I was mildly retarded. I remember one day that I needed to go to a job site over by the Astrodome in Houston and I couldn't go because I couldn't. saying the right thing and later somebody that knows you will tell you that what you said really wasn't so good. Prior to the visit they had had her on Menda, which is an Alzheimer's drug, which actually made her worse. She had already become somewhat better from the coconut oil therapy. It was getting worse and he was asking me the same question over and over again and I'd answer him and I'd say, Tom, don't you remember you just asked me that? And then he w went to the doctor and had a CAT scan, and it showed he had early Alzheimer's. There are a whole host of brain diseases that are linked to mercury epidemiologically. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, MS, autism, and acrodynia are all brain diseases, and that they're all linked to mercury. Many patients come into me and say, well, my other dentist said there's no research, there's no science behind the problem with mercury fillings. They say there's nothing wrong with it. The ADA has proof that it's safe. Well, the, the real truth is there is no proof of safety. Those that were on the highest dose of thyroid were the ones that had the improvement of memory, improvement of cognition, improvement of well-being. This time I became a 13-year-old high school student and I did not know my wife again. This time I retrograded 48 years of my life. My entire adult life had been eradicated. I said, I don't care what any of you guys say. That was a drug reaction and it was due to my Lipitor and this is what triggered my research into the statin drug use. Basically I'm speaking to two audiences. One is people in the streets, people at the grassroots level who have the power to reverse Alzheimer's disease in their own homes, on their own, without their need of medical assistance. But the second group I'm talking to are the medical doctors and the scientists who have the power to study this, have the power to facilitate the process and aid their patients in overcoming Alzheimer's disease. And so that's why my um, PowerPoint presentations are so technical and so scientific is because I want these people to understand the reality is that there's science underneath this approach. It's been a, a, a great um, story to have my mother back. And, um, and people are, all her family and friends are saying the same thing. Geez, Lorraine, you're back. I started to think again, and I started to be able to write again. And After the supplementation, I, my brain woke up. After about three months, I started noticing clearing of my mind. When Alzheimer's started on me, I didn't go to the doctors with it. My mother went to the doctors and they never even slowed it down. And luckily I was able to do it. It was just like watching a dead flower, you know, get watered and start to come back. And my brain just came back. When he got better, it was such a relief. I had my husband back. According to science, I shouldn't be here. I'm privileged to be alive every day and enjoy life.
Patricia Tomowski. I'm one of the filmmakers. People ask us how we got into this. My grandmother died of Alzheimer's disease. My mother was diagnosed with mixed Alzheimer's and dementia. We went online looking for some vitamins that might slow her, prog her, pro pro her progression down a little bit. What we found was pe were people that had actually reversed Alzheimer's. We were shocked. We said, why isn't this all over the news? My partner and husband, Scott, who's back there with the video camera, <laughs> has 30 years experience with network news as a photographer, videographer, engineer, producer, and editor. So we decided to make this film. So who would like to know how they did it? Okay, well let's find out. When we went around the country and interviewed these people, and we have a lot more people to interview, but we did our first round of interviews with the funding that we had. We put the people into several different categories. So I'm going to summarize the categories, and then we'll go into each one individually. The first category is inappropriate nutrition. People were eating way too much sugar and not nearly enough healthy fats. Many of them have had vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Another way they got their um, minds back is that they eliminated all the toxins um, from both their environment and their diet and as much as they could. Another thing that they did was modify their or eliminated their prescription medications because many of those meds have side effects that cause dementia. They detoxed from heavy metals. They balance their hormone levels. They treated their inflammation. And inflammation can come from anything from food allergies to Lyme disease to low-level infections that you don't even know that you have. They also eliminated stress and increased their physical, mental, and social activity. So let's take the first one. The first one is inappropriate nutrition. And I'm going to talk a little, tell you a story about Anne to demonstrate it. Um, Anne was a very special woman. Now, about a year and a half before we met her, she had been given two weeks to live. She was very, very severe um, category of dementia. If you put your hand in front of your, her face, she would not recognize you. She did not know any of her family members. She could not move except for her head. The family decided uh, that they would like her to die at home versus in a facility, so they brought her home. What happened was they gave her a choice on nutrition. They said, we can either put a feeding tube in her, we can do IV, or she still has her sucking reflex so that she can um, drink through a straw. Well, her son happens to be a nutritional microbiologist, so he said, hey, we'll do the straw. And what he did is he gave her a very nutrient-dense diet full of organic fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, uh, supplements, omega-3s. He also knew, because of his nutrition experience, that gluten, dairy, and sugar all caused inflammation. So he completely eliminated those from his mother's diet. We met Anne. About, uh, about 18 months later, after this, she was walking around in a walker. Uh, she had made meatloaf a few days before. She could carry on a coherent conversation. She could have dinner with her family. And she went on to live for four more years with her, her cognition intact. She didn't make it all the way back, but the fact that she had gone from such a state to pretty much a, a normal, reasonably normal life for the last four years is pretty incredible. Now let's take a look at the strategies that her son used to get rid of Anne's dementia symptoms. The first thing he did was limit his consumption of carbohydrates. We're taught, we've been taught for the last 30 years, low fat, low fat, low fat. The bottom line is, as we get older, we often have trouble processing sugar. 
And carbohydrates, wheat, grain, pasta, bread, cereal, all turn into sugar in our bodies. And as we get older, we're less and less able to handle them. So instead, he gave her a lot of healthy fats. Our brain is able to use fat for fuel. Coconut oil is one of the best brain foods out there. Olive oil, avocado, flaxseed oil. There are great healthy fats out there that your brain absolutely loves to use as fuel. How many of you in this audience have heard that coconut oil is bad for you? One. Okay, two. Okay. So just so that it used to be that it was it was considered bad for you, but if you look at this list of items, all of these things are either improved or can be eliminated with coconut oil. It's pretty impressive. Now, coconut oil is not all, not everyone realizes this, but it's actually antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory. It's very, very good for you. It also increases the good cholesterol and decreases the bad cholesterol. So generally, it's going to improve your cholesterol ratio. Dr. Mary Newport uh, gives her husband about three to four tablespoons a day of coconut oil, one with each meal and one just before bed. And she found with her, um, basically from people, email, website, things like that, that up to 80% of people are improved on coconut oil alone. That doesn't mean to say that they completely eliminated their dementia, just that they were significantly improved. There have been other studies that show that a ketogenic diet or a low glycemic diet with coconut oil, um, they, they've, uh, 90%, they've spoken to caregivers, and again, 90% of dementia patients are improved on this diet. It doesn't mean that their dementia is gone, but still, it's a good first step. So, we've increased, we've decreased the carbohydrates and sugars, we've increased the fats. The other thing he did was correct his mother's vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Many people with dementias are low on vitamin D, vitamin B12, they're not taking probiotics. And he also gave her very nutrient dense food so that she was actually getting more nutrients from her food as well because of the really good combination of, of natural whole foods that she got versus processed foods. She literally had no processed foods in her diet. He also eliminated all artificial flavors, colors, and sweeteners from his mother's diet. The other really important thing that's often eliminated is hydration. It's very important for good brain function that you drink enough water and that you stay hydrated. So, the next area that we're talking about is toxins. And we're going to give a little bit of demonstration on toxins uh, from Paul Barton. Paul is just an amazing gentleman. His mother died of Alzheimer's over a 10-year period. The last three years of her life, she did not know who her son was. When Paul turned 65, it was like deja vu. He started having the exact same symptoms his mother had in the early stages of her dementia. And he knew that he was fighting against the clock. If he didn't find an answer quickly, he was going to be in the same state that his mother was. Now, this gentleman uh, never went past high school. And he decided to go to the library, and he learned biology, chemistry, physiology, and started reading medical papers. Now, he was very determined. He was probably spending 14, 16 hours a day researching. About a year into his research, one day, he found that he couldn't understand a page that he was reading. He read, was able to read the page the day before. So what had changed? And he finally got it down to, he had gone down the street, and he had bought some frozen custard from the corner deli. And there was a little ingredient in that frozen custard called vanillin, also known as artificial vanilla flavor. 
And that was what made him unable to read and understand the medical paper he was reading. He did a lot more testing, and he figured out that actually any artificial flavor, color, or sweetener caused him dementia. Also MSG, and just anything that wasn't, um, the biggest issue actually was, one of the big issues was also was, was aspartame. So anything artificial would cause him dementia. He could induce dementia in himself simply by eating a lot of these foods. And he said, he recounted once to us, he said, I was at a stoplight and I didn't know, I knew I was close to home, but I did not know whether to go right, left, or straight ahead to get there. So the good news is Paul eliminated all those items from his diet. We met him 10 years later at age 75, and he has now written a book called All Alzheimer's Unmasked. Now, neurotoxic foods are everywhere. They, one of the questions that we asked ourselves was why are these foods legal? We couldn't figure it out. They were obviously neurotoxic. They're shown to be neurotoxic. And the reason is, is that the FDA categorizes many of these items as food. That means they go into the grass category, generally recognized as safe. They have not been tested by the FDA. Some of them have, like aspartame. However, and by the way, if you look at that sweet and low, equal, and Splenda, those are all different versions of aspartame. You do not want to eat these. And if you have a family member with dementia, you want to make sure that they do not consume these items. So those items were kind of pushed. Aspartame was pushed through the FDA. The scientific panel actually um, wouldn't approve it. And uh, the head of the FDA went over their heads, essentially. So other known neurotoxins, pesticides, herbicides, uh, Things like toothpaste, shampoo, laundry detergent, soaps, household cleaning supplies, many of these are totally avoidable toxins. If you have a family member with dementia, you do not want them exposed to any of these items. There are non-toxic makeup, non-toxic soap, non-toxic laundry detergent. Okay, in case you don't believe me, I'm going to give you the mouse study. Pretty cute, huh? <laughs> so if you put four mice in two cages and you teach them how to go through a maze and it takes them about 20 seconds, and this has been replicated many, many times, you introduce a quarter teaspoon of yellow dye number five or any kind of yellow dye to the water in one of the cages. So the water is barely colored, it's almost clear. In one day, the average running time of the mice in those, that cage is 100 seconds. The water-only mice are 20 seconds. And in five days, 200 seconds. Our question is, we're feeding this to our children, we're feeding this to our elderly, why are these items legal? in our food supply. The good news is that when the dye was removed, in six days, the average running time for the mice went back to 20 seconds. So it was repeated with red, blue, and green dyes. So don't think it's just the yellow. It's not. <laughs> so let's go on to the next category, which is side effects from prescription medications. This is Dr. Dwayne Graveline. He actually lives just up the coast in Cocoa Beach, Florida. He was a medical doctor and an NASA astronaut. And he took Lipitor and lost his memory. Then he decided to do some research. Fortunately, when he stopped taking Lipitor, he got the memory back. <laughs> and he has written four books. Two of them are Lipitor, Thief of Memory. Another one is The Statin Damage Crisis. Um, he also had a lot of other side effects. He uh, had extreme difficulty walking. And in his studies, he has email from over 500 people who are in wheelchairs because of statin drugs. 
The science behind statin drugs is very, very weak. And there is a lot of money involved because a lot of people are on statin drugs. Check out spacedoc.net. Um, and you can also go to amazon.com and take a look at the plethora of books on the damage that statin drugs do. For little, if any, benefit, by the way. So it's not just statins, it's also pain medication that can cause dementia. If you look at the bottle, one of our board members, her father was in his uh, 80s, and he had three different medications, and all three showed memory loss as a side effect and cognitive <laughs> difficulties as a side effect. So why, of course he had memory loss and cognitive um, issues. So what they did is they worked with the doctor and the doctor actually eliminated two of the medications, changed one of them, and his dementia went away. This is not uncommon. Now cholesterol is vital to physical and cognitive health. How many of you know that the brain is actually made of cholesterol? Okay, if you reduce your cholesterol too much, you will not be able to think. There's a 2005 NIH study that shows that when cholesterol is under 200, the cognitive performance is worse than if it's over 200. A 2011 study, women with high cholesterol actually have fewer heart attacks and are healthier all over. There's another study that they took the healthiest women, both physically and mentally, in their 70s and 80s, and guess what their cholesterol was? 240 to 280. Again, the science of statins is very weak. So, let's go on to mercury and other heavy metals. This, was a, this is actually a biggie. Tom Warren, he had was diagnosed with early Alzheimer's at age 53 in his hometown of Seattle. They wanted a second opinion, so they traveled to the, May the Mayo Clinic, and they got a confirmation of his Alzheimer's diagnosis. In addition, they had physical proof. He had a CT scan that showed frontal lobe brain shrinkage. They basically said, you're not going to have too many more months. You better put your affairs in order now where you can still think. They didn't really believe them. They said, there's got to be something we can do. They tried diet. Uh, they checked for food allergies. They tried eliminating foods, uh, digestive enzymes, just the standard holistic things. And this is an example where the holistic things, you think, well, maybe they just threw up their arms and said, well, holistic medicine obviously didn't work. Until they found out that every single silver filling in his mouth was 50% mercury and Tom had a mouthful of them. So he made the decision to get dentures. It took him three dentists to get dentures because they wouldn't give it to him, but he did not want the exposure getting them out. Uh, if you use a mercury-safe dentist, that exposure is very, very minimal. But he said, you know what? I'd rather have my brain than my teeth. So I'm not taking any chances. Plus he had so many. What was really cool is that within a month of the time he got all of the mercury out of his mouth, his brain's function started to improve. He went on to write two books. How many people know someone diagnosed with Alzheimer's that later writes two books? Okay. So the really interesting thing is that three years later, his CAT scan was normal. The frontal lobe brain shrinkage was gone. This is absolute proof that you can regrow brain cells. He died 20 years later of um, unrelated causes. But his story is not the only one that we ran into that Alzheimer's was caused by heavy metal poisoning. Now Denise, the reason I picked Denise as an example is that her cognitive issues were actually caused because she decided to get all of the silver out of her mouth for cosmetic reasons and replace them with white fillings. The problem is she didn't use a mercury-safe dentist. She used a regular dentist. 
So think about the exposure of drilling out a lot of fillings all at once. The dentists simply don't know that these fillings are dangerous. They're told in dental school, hey, they leach a little tiny, tiny bit and it's not significant. Well, Denise has proved that it was because she had to quit her job. She was an airline attendant and she used to fly to the wrong airport. <laughs> she would put food under her bed. She would put shoes in the fridge. She would get lost in her own neighborhood. The local police all knew who she was because she would have to follow them home because she did not know her way home. Fortunately, a friend took her to a holistic medical doctor and they did heavy metal detox. That doctor said he had never seen any human being alive with her mercury levels. And the good news is she's now able to live independently. She's back. So how toxic is mercury? We all know that lead is very toxic. Mercury is probably at least 100 times more toxic than lead. It's one of the most toxic substances on the planet. It accumulates in the body and brain. People say, well, this is no big deal. I've been, we, most of us have been exposed to lead. We've been exposed to lead pipes. If you're over the age of 40, you've been exposed to lead pipes. You've been exposed to lead paint. Um, and actually, many younger people have because we live in houses that were built before the 70s and 80s. So what happens is the heavy metals get stored in your fat, in your kidneys, in your liver, in your bones, in various body tissues, safely. And then you get more, and all of a sudden it doesn't have a safe place to go. So it goes to your brain, and you may end up with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, or MS. You may end up with liver disease, kidney disease, or heart disease, or you may end up with cancer. We know people who have gotten the silver fillings out of their mouth and their MS has gone away, their cancer has gone away. This material is toxic. And mercury can produce the exact same symptoms as Alzheimer's and there is scientific literature to back that up. So if you look at this neuron right here, this this neuron was very, very happy in its petri dish with its solution until this little bit of mercury didn't even have to touch the neuron, it just had to be near the neuron. And this neuron just went down to absolute nothingness. So, how many of you knew before you walked in here that every single silver filling in your mouth is 50% mercury? Okay, about a third. How many of you knew before you walked in tonight that the Environmental Protection Agency, as soon as that filling is out of your mouth, considers it hazardous waste? Okay, even fewer. How many of you know, knew before you walked in here that the FDA never conducted safety tests for amalgam fillings? They were grandfathered in. These fillings leach mercury. Every time you breathe, they go into your lungs, they go into your bloodstream, and they cross the blood-brain barrier. Every time you swallow through your saliva, they wreak havoc on your digestive system. By the way, some people ask us, why is it that some people can have 30 fillings and they're just fine, and other people have a few and they're affected? That's because all of us have different genetics. Some of us are very, very good at detoxifying mercury, and others aren't. And as we get older, we are less and less able to detoxify. So my suggestion is, before you get dementia, <laughs> think about slowly getting them removed. And you can go to the resource section of sharpagain.org, and there are holistic dental associations that know how to remove these fillings safely. 
This is a 25-year-old filling off-gassing mercury vapor, just in case you weren't absolutely sure that it was dangerous from what I've told you. <laughs> Here's some physical proof. And when you chew, you eat, drink hot coffee, and certainly when the dentist drills, you have much more exposure than this. According to the World Health Organization, the largest cause of mercury poisoning in human beings is not fish. It is actually silver amalgam dental fillings. Vaccines also have mercury. Thimerosal, even thimerosal-free vaccines have very tiny, tiny amounts of mercury, even though it doesn't have to be on the label. It's methyl mercury. It's actually thousands of times more toxic than elemental mercury, and it's going straight into your bloodstream. Flu vaccines all have thimerosal in them. Uh, large fish, um, you know, we, some of us have stopped eating tuna because it's, it's a large fish and it has a lot of mercury in it. So stick to the smaller fishes and wild caught fish. Omega 3s from fish are very good. You have to balance that against the mercury that all fish have. Air and water pollution is another issue. So um, if you have dementia, we, you know, vaccines are not great for you in, in our opinion anyway, but certainly if you have someone with dementia, you really want to think twice about getting them vac vaccinated. Okay, so let's go on to uh, T3 and hormone levels. So we'd like to share Helen's story. So Helen was a marketing manager, and over time, she slowly lost the ability to do her job. She couldn't write, she couldn't organize her thoughts. Um, then she became physically uh, disabled in a way. She was having difficulty walking, and as many people who have hormone issues, she started to lose her hair, parts of her eyebrows. Uh, and she came to the point where she said to her family, I'm really suffering. I'm going to give it two more weeks. And if I can't find something that's going to help my condition, I may choose to take my life and I hope you're going to support me. I don't know anything a family would dread more than that. So like many people who are searching for some relief, she spent a lot of time on the computer and she ran across someone who could help her. Uh, her symptoms reflected the fact that she had low thyroid, but in particular T3, which is the active form of thyroid. And this woman who she located said to her, tomorrow morning, wake up and take your temperature. And when Helen did that, it was actually 92.6 or something. It was under 93 degrees. Um, so she went back to her doctor and requested different tests, which came back positive. And the doctor, like many endocrinologists, put her on Synthroid. Synthroid, typically, it replaces T4. Our bodies, we convert T4 to T3, typically. Uh, we're able to do that. But as we get older, we lose the ability to do that. So some people who've been on Synthroid for many, many years can suddenly start having cognitive issues if they're not able to convert to T3. The good news is Helen was then given natural desiccated thyroid that comes from an animal and it replaces the entire thyroid panel from T1 to T4. And because she was getting that needed T3, her mind started to come back. And it took a few months until those levels were, were sufficient for her,
but she knew she was getting better, and that certainly gave her hope. So today, she's, she's back. She's fine, she's working, she's active. Uh, a good story. This is Dr. Liu, Dr. Shahang Liu. So Dr. Liu was a traditional medical practitioner, and she used to be able to dictate her patient notes at the end of the day. And she suddenly started having problems remembering who she'd seen and what their issues were. So she had to dictate after every single patient. Had to schedule her patients differently to, to get that time in. She was then tested for hormone levels and it was found that her estrogen was down to the level of an 80 year old woman. What restored her memory was bioidentical hormones. And interestingly enough today, Dr. Liu is now a holistic practitioner. So we're very happy that she has joined the ranks and that she knows how to treat this particular condition because as we've learned, many endocrinologists and internists, regular physicians, are still not testing T3 levels when they're saying they're testing your thyroid. So inadequate levels of all of these different hormones can cause cognitive dysfunction and they can be detected and corrected if they're tested and treated with either natural hormones like uh, Armour Thyroid, their, their other brands, uh, or bioidentical hormones. We wanted to throw this up there to show you some of the symptoms of low thyroid. I don't know that many of us would realize that all of these things can be a result of having hypothyroid uh, glands. So traditionally doctors would use these symptoms to, to dose and to give the, right, the correct amount of natural desiccated thyroid. So I mentioned this earlier, a lot of times you'll go to a, a doctor's office and the tests will come back normal because they haven't tested for T3. It's usually TSH and, uh, and T4. And we know that that very important element is T3. So many I would say many people that I see in a nursing home I feel should be tested for thyroid. I don't think it's natural necessarily that so many elderly people are freezing cold all the time. So we know that thyroid can play a role in that. The next area we'd like to talk about is inflammation, which has gotten lots of play in the press. Uh, and as Titian mentioned, these can be caused by many, many different things, including uh, root canals and food sensitivities. Many of my clients have food sensitivities upon testing, but have no symptoms. Or there are people who have had symptoms all their life and think, oh, I've got a little indigestion or irritable bowel, or there's something else going on that's not quite well defined. A lot of times we find out with testing that people actually have maybe not an immune reaction to foods, but a sensitivity which is causing problems in their digestive tract. So inflammation causes dementia by really mucking up the works in your, in your body. If you have inflammation, your body processes are not going to be functioning well. Some of the other things that contribute to that are GMOs, genetically modified foods. Uh, we know that corn and soy in particular are some of the most highly genetically modified foods in our, in our country. 
some of these other foods uh, Tish has already talked about. We met a woman at one of our presentations who was in her late 20s who had gone undiagnosed with Lyme's disease and actually at her age had started to exhibit dementia symptoms. And she's not the only one we've heard from. So we know that Lyme's disease has a dementia component to it, which is why it's so important to get it treated early if you, if you can detect it. And some of these other things, mold, molds and fungus also, these are low-level infections in the body. You can have them for years and years. You don't realize that it's having an effect on the body, but over time it does. And frankly, if you have more than one of these things, you can imagine the kind of havoc that's, that's wreaked on the body. It really lowers your immune system. I mean, it's, um, it, it's something that will keep you from being well throughout your life. The last category on our list is stress and mental, social, and physical inactivity. And these are, have always been considered lifestyle issues. They're things that I work with clients on all the time. I don't think we realized how much of an effect that they have on, uh, on cognition and wellness, but I think if you think about times in your life when you've really been stressed, can you think clearly? Do you get a little muddled? Do you, you know, forget what, why you walked into the next room or you know, the next thing you're supposed to be doing? Um, so stress really does play a big role and we'll find out why. All disease has a stress component to it. If the body has no stress, you're likely not going to be ill. So stress definitely lowers our immune function. It also will get in the way of the body being able to function at its optimum. And so it's, your cells are not going to be getting as much, much oxygen as they need. Uh, you, you won't be getting the nutrients because the cells aren't able to absorb it. Stress puts brakes on your body functioning in general. So when we talk about people who are aging, and obviously people make decisions at different times, but you've all, I mean, you've all heard of people who retire in six months. They're no longer with us. They may have a heart attack or fall uh, ill for, for some reason. So just some of the life changes, such as retirement or changing where you live, um, your financial situation might change. Uh, we all know what happened with the Great Recession in 2008 and people were starting to have to live with sons and daughters again. Uh, they were worried about would they, would they have money left for retirement. Stress ages people. I think we, we know that. We can see it even in those that, that are our friends or our loved ones. And we also know that there are certain things that we can do to reduce stress or try to eliminate it from our bodies. I mean, one thing uh, is exercise, and you've all heard that. I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, but we also know that support, emotional support, uh, mental stimulation, these things really can help just put, put a break on stress and keep us feeling like we're in a good place moving forward in our lives. So stress, I would say to you, can't be underrated. And I think in our society today, we don't even realize how much stress we're under. All the electronics we're using, all the information that's coming into us so quickly, all the time. What we hear on the news, the immediacy of the information, we are bombarded. And so years ago, Andrew Weil, who is a doctor, who's an integrative uh, physician, suggested that one, one day a week you do a news fast. Like you don't listen to the news, you do not read the newspaper. It's amazing how relaxed you might feel taking a break from just that. We want to 
wanted to share with you a couple of stories of people who had gotten well by not just one thing, but a combination of things. Because we know, looking at that list of seven items, that there may not be one magic thing for a given person. So Lorraine had reached the age of 92, perfectly healthy, doing fine, lots of friends, very warm family. Tish and Scott interviewed them. But she was diagnosed at a memory clinic as having Alzheimer's, and the doctor said she's going to go downhill from here. She was declared incompetent, and there was no hope. But her son said, maybe there's something that can be done. And after visiting a holistic doctor who was shown on the film clip, many different treatments were done because of her testing. And it showed that with things like coconut oil therapy and chelation, which is detoxification from heavy metals, and eliminating dairy and gluten from her diet, a lot of the things that we've already talked about, this combination of treatments allowed her after six months uh, to come back. Like her, her, uh, her son said, you know, my mother is back. The de court declared her confident again. She handled her own finances, wrote her own checks, and lived three more or two and a half more years uh, fully cognitive and functioning. So it was a lovely, lovely story to see. Now Maureen, you can see, I mean, she's not even that old after, after all now, but she had been in an Alzheimer's study already for 18 months. So they believed that she was really just going downhill. She wasn't going to get better. She was so bad that she, she could, didn't even remember to eat. She couldn't read a book. But she had a friend who recommended that she go see some holistic practitioners in New York. And as it turned out, they put her on a series of treatments. Some of the things we've already talked about, detoxifying, but there's something called ozone therapy, which is a different type of detoxification treatment that was very effective for Maureen. She changed her diet. She started taking supplements. And Maureen now lives independently. I think that the people who were conducting that study were amazed that anyone could turn around their condition as she did. So we would like to emphasize strongly at this point that it is critical to test and treat for all of these things until you find a solution to cognitive dysfunction in either yourselves or your loved ones. These are the things we know about now. I think we'll be adding to this list as we go because we already have. But this year, a study came out that really is confirming our idea of this protocol, this living protocol, because a series of treatments and tests were done on 10 people. It was a very small sample, admittedly, but 90% of them got well enough to resume their lives, to go back to work, and really had come back fully from their dementia. So we see in the literature, I mean, I live in New York, so the New York Times, the Science Times, I mean, they run articles all the time. And we've been doing this work now for a little over two years, and more and more we see articles coming out, there's research that is supporting what we're talking to you about tonight. So our big question to the medical world is, why isn't testing for these reversible factors standard treatment for every dementia patient? So at this point we'd like to ask again, how many of you believe that there's something that you could do to reverse or prevent Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, good. Then we've done our job. <laughs> <laughs>